Chapter Sixteen of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Sixteen: A Fighting Chance. The dining room of the old red house was cool and fragrant from the blossoming heliotrope bed below its window. The twilight, which is long in eastern Maine, shed a soft glow over the old mahogany and silver and an equally soft and becoming radiance over the two women seated at the table after a sonorous blessing uttered by mrs stoddard in tones full of unction she and agatha ate supper in a sympathetic silence it was a meal upon which sally kingsbury expended her best powers as cook with no mean results but nobody took much notice of it after all mrs stoddard poured her tea into her saucer drinking and eating absent-mindedly her face lighted with something very like a smile whenever she caught agatha's eyes but to her talk was not necessary sally hovered around the door even though lizzie had condescended to put on a white apron and serve but agatha sent the city maid away bidding her wait on the people in the sick-room instead mr hind had been left with the patient and had acquiesced in the plan to stay on duty until midnight when mrs stoddard was to be called agatha had spent an hour with james helping mrs stoddard or watching the patient while the nurse made necessary trips to the kitchen the sight of james woeful plight drove every thought from her mind engagements and managers lost their reality and became shadow memories beside the vividness of his desperate need he had no knowledge of her or of any efforts to secure his comfort he talked incessantly sometimes in a soft unintelligible murmur sometimes in loud and emphatic tones his eyes were brilliant but wandering his movements were abrupt or violent heedless or feeble as the moment decreed he talked about the dingy nasty forecastle the absurdity of his not being able to get around the fine outfit of the seagull the chill of the water he sometimes swore softly almost apologetically and he uttered most unchristian sentiments toward some person whom he described as wearing extremely neat and dandified clothes after the first five minutes agatha paid no heed to his words and could bear to stay in the room only when she was able to do something to soothe or comfort him she was not wholly unfamiliar with illness and the trouble that comes in its train but the sight of james with his unrecognizing eyes and his wits astray a superb engine gone wild brought a sharp and hitherto unknown pain to her throat she stood over his bed holding his hands when he would reach frenziedly into the air after some object of his feverish desire she coaxed him back to his pillow when he fancied he must run to catch something that was escaping him it took nerve and strength to care for him unceasing vigilance and ingenuity were required in circumventing his erratic movements and through it all there was something about his clean honest mind and person that stirred only affectionate pity he was a child taking a child's liberties mrs stoddard brooded over him already as a mother over her dearest son mr hunt had turned gentle as a woman and gave the service of love not of the eye his skill in managing almost rivalled mrs stoddard's james accepted hans ministrations as a matter of course became more docile under his treatment and watched for him when he disappeared indeed the whole household was taxed for james and agatha deeply distressed as she was throbbed with gratitude that she could help care for him if only for an hour thus it was that the two women eating their supper and looking out over hercules thayer's pleasant garden were silent mrs stoddard was thinking about the duties of the night agatha was swallowed up in the miseries of the last hour mrs stoddard was the first to rise she was tipping off on her fingers a number of items which agatha did not catch saying hm and yes to herself despite her deep anxiety mrs stoddard was in her element she had nothing less than genius in nursing she was cheerful quick in emergencies steady under the excitements of the sick-room and faithful in small as well as large matters 
moreover she excelled most doctors in her ability to interpret changes and symptoms and in her ingenuity in dealing with them her two days with james had given her an understanding of the case and she was ready with new devices for his relief agatha finished her tea and joined mrs stoddard as she stood looking out into the twilight seeing things not visible to the outward eye yes that's it she ended abruptly thinking aloud then including agatha without any change of tone she went on i think we'd better change our plans a little i'm going upstairs now to stay while your mr hand goes over to the house for me there are several things i want from home agatha had no conception of having an opinion that was contrary to mrs stoddard's so completely was she won by her tower-like strength you know mrs stoddard she said earnestly that i want to be told at once if if there is any change i know child the older woman replied with a faraway look we are in the lord's hands he taketh the young in their might and he healeth them that are nigh unto death we can only wait his will agatha was the product of a different age and a different system of thought but she was still young and the pressure of the hour revived in her some ghost of her puritan ancestral faith longing to become a reality in her heart again if only for this dire emergency she turned eager but painfully embarrassed to mrs stoddard detaining her by a touch on her arm but you said mrs stoddard she implored that the prayer of faith shall heal the sick and i have been praying too i have tried to summon my faith do you believe that it counts for good mrs stoddard's rapt gaze blessed agatha her faith and courage were of the same type that rise according to need she drew nearer to her sanctuary to the fountain of her faith as her earthly peril waxed her voice rang with confidence as she almost chanted no striving toward god is ever lost dear child he is with us in our sorrow even as in our joy her strong hand closed over agatha's for a moment and then her steady slow steps sounded on the stairs agatha went into the parlor whose windows opened upon the piazza and from there wandered down the low steps to the lawn it was growing dusk a still comfortable evening over the lawn lay the indescribable freshness of a region surrounded by many trees and acres of grass presently the old hound danny came slowly from his kennel in the back yard and paced the grass beside agatha looking up often with melancholy eyes into her face here was a living relic of her mother's dead friend carrying in his countenance his sorrow for his departed master agatha longed to comfort him a little convey to him the thought that she would love him and try to understand his nature now that his rightful master was gone she talked softly to him calling him to her but not touching him back and forth they paced the old dog following closer and closer to agatha's heels back of the house was a path leading diagonally across to the wall which separated parson thayer's place from the meeting-house the dog seemed intent on following this path agatha humored him climbed the low stile and entered the churchyard as the hound leapt the stile after her he wagged his tail and appeared almost happy agatha remembered that sally had told her on the day of her arrival of the dog and how he was accustomed to walk every evening with his master doubtless they sometimes walked here among the silent company assembled in the churchyard and the minister's silent friend was now having the peculiar satisfaction of doing again what he had once done with his master thus the little acre of the dead had its claim on life and its happiness for throbbing hearts agatha called the old dog to her again this time he came near rubbed hard against her dress and when she sat down on a flat tombstone laid his head comfortably in her lap wagging his tail in satisfaction danny was a companion who did not obstruct thought but encouraged it and as agatha sat resting on the stone with danny close by in that quiet yard full of the noiseless ghosts of the past her thoughts went back to james 
his unnatural eyes and restless spirit haunted her she thought of that other night on the water full of heart-breaking struggle as it was as a happy night compared to the one which was yet to come she recalled their foolish talk while they were on the beach and smiled sadly over it her courage was at the ebb she felt that the buoyancy of spirit that had sustained them both during the night of struggle could never revisit the wasted and disorganized body lying in parson thayer's house her house a certain practical sense that was strong in her rose and questioned whether she had done everything that could be done for his welfare she thought so had she not even prayed with all her concentration of mind and will she heard again susan stoddard's deep voice no striving toward god is ever lost in spite of her unfaith a sense of rest in a power larger than herself came upon her unawares danny who had wandered away came back and sat down heavily on the edge of her skirt close to her good danny she praised petting him to his heart's content it was thus that aleck van camp found them as he came over the stile from the house his tones were slower and more precise than ever but his face was drawn and marked with anxiety he had a careful thought for agatha even in the face of his greater trouble you have chosen a bad hour to wander about miss redmond the evening dews are heavy yes i know danny and i were just going home have you been into the house yes i left dr thayer there in consultation with the other physician that came to-day they sent me off old jim well you know as well as i do with your permission i'm going to stay the night i'll bunk in the hall or anywhere don't think of a bed for me i don't want one i'm glad you'll stay it seems somehow as if everyone helps that is everyone who cares for him dr thayer thinks there will be a change to-night though it is difficult to tell jim's family have my telegram by this time and they will get my letter to-morrow probably anyway i shall wait until morning before i send another message the tension of their thoughts was too sharp they turned for relief to the scene before them stopping at the stile to look back at the steepled white church standing under its spreading balm of gilead tree it seems strange said agatha to think that i sat out there under that big tree as a little girl everything is so different now ilion then was once your home no never my home though it was once my mother's home i used to visit here occasionally years and years ago aleck produced his quizzical grin a gallant person would protest that that is incredible i wasn't angling for gallantry agatha replied wearily i am twenty-six and i haven't been here certainly since i was eight years old eighteen years are good many to youth yes acquiesced aleck which reminds me by contrast of the hermit he was so incredibly old it was he who unwittingly put me on jim's track he said that the owner or proprietor of the jeanne d'arc was dropped ashore on his island monsieur chatelard cried agatha i don't know his name if it was monsieur chatelard agatha paused looking earnestly at aleck if it was he it is the man who tricked me into his motor-car in new york drugged me and carried me aboard his yacht while i was unconscious aleck turned a sharp though not unsympathetic gaze upon agatha i have told no one but dr thayer and he did not believe me but it is quite true the wreck saved me probably from something worse though i don't know what if there had been scepticism on aleck's face for an instant it had disappeared instead there was deep concern as he considered the case had you ever seen the man chatelard before never to my knowledge did he visit you on board the yacht only once i was put into the charge of an old lady a frenchwoman madame sophie evidently a trusted chaperon or nurse or something like that when i came to myself in a very luxurious cabin in the yacht this old woman was talking to me in french a strange medley that i could make nothing of 
when i was better she questioned me about everything saying mon dieu at every answer i made then she left me and was gone a long time and when she came back the man was with her i learned afterward that he was called monsieur chatelard they both looked at me arguing fiercely in such a furious french that i could not understand more than half they said they looked as if they were appraising me like an article for sale but madame sophie held out steadily on some point against monsieur chatelard and finally it appeared that she converted him to her own point of view he went away very angry and i did not see him again except at a distance until the night of the wreck did you find out where they were going or who was back of their scheme no nothing or very little there was money involved i could tell that but no names were mentioned nor any places that i can remember you see i was ill from the effects of the chloroform and frightened too i think i don't wonder said aleck wrinkling his homely face he remained silent while he searched mentally for a clue i found out through my maid who arrived to-day that some one of the kidnapping party had been clever enough to send a false message to the hotel explaining my sudden departure i see said aleck going over the story in his mind and presently where does hand come in and how did jim happen to be aboard the jeanne d'arc hand was some sort of henchman to monsieur chatelard i believe and he told me that your cousin was picked up in new york harbor swimming for life it appeared no one seemed to know any more aleck stopped short looked at agatha pursed his lips for a whistle and remained silent they had arrived at the porch steps and were tacitly waiting for the doctors to descend and give them if possible some encouragement for the coming night but the story of the jeanne d'arc had grown more complicated than aleck had anticipated and much was yet to be explained aleck was slow as always in thinking it through but he figured it out finally to a certain point and expressed himself thus that's the way with your steady fellows they're all the bigger fools when they do jump pardon me i didn't catch oh nothing said aleck half irritably i only said jim needed a poke like that heifer over in the next field agatha understood the boyish irritation cloaking the love of the man you may be able to get more information about your cousin from mr hunt she said he would be likely to know as much as anybody well however it happened he's here now though if it had not been for his fearful struggle for me he would not have been so ill said agatha miserably aleck with one foot on the low step of the piazza stopped and turned squarely toward her his face was no less miserable than agatha's but behind his wretchedness and anxiety was some masculine reserve of power and a longer view down the corridors of time he held her eye with a look of great earnestness i love old jim miss redmond we've been boys and men together and good fellows always but don't think that i'd regret his struggle for you as you call it even if it should mean the worst he couldn't have done otherwise and i wouldn't have had him and if it's to be a home run why then jim would like that far better than to die of old age or liver complaint it's all right miss redmond aleck's slow words came with a double meaning to agatha she heard through them echoes of james hambleton's boyhood she saw a picture of his straight and dauntless youth she held out to aleck a hand that trembled but her face shone with gratitude aleck took her hand respectfully kindly in his warm grasp besides he said simply we won't give up he's got a fighting chance yet End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Seventeen The Turn of the Tide. Lights in a country house at night are often the signal of birth or death, sometimes of both. 
the old red house threw its beacon from almost every window that night and seemed mutely to defy the onslaught of enveloping darkness whether plutonic or stygian time was when parson thayer's library lamp burned nightly into the little hours and through the uncurtained windows the churchyard ghosts had they wandered that way could have seen his long thin form wrapped in a paisley cloth dressing-gown sitting in the glow he would have been reading some old leather-bound volume and would have remained for hours almost as quiet and noiseless as the ghosts themselves now he had stepped across his threshold and joined them and new spirits had come to burn the light in the old red house agatha half dressed had slept and woke feeling that the night must be far advanced the house was very still with no sound or echo of the incoherent tones which for now many days had come from the room down the hall she lit a candle and the sputtering match seemed to fill the house with noise her clock indicated a little past midnight it was only twenty minutes since she had lain down but she was wide awake and refreshed while she was pinning up her hair in a big mass on the top of her head she heard in the hall slow steady steps firm but not heavy even as in daytime susan stoddard did not tiptoe agatha was at the door before she could knock you had better come for a few minutes mrs stoddard said the tones were in themselves an adjuration to faith and fortitude yes i will come said agatha they walked together down the dimly lighted hall each woman in her own way proving how strong and efficient is the discipline of self-control in the sick-room a screen shaded the light from the bed which had been pulled out almost into the middle of the room near the bed was a table with bottles glasses a covered pitcher and on the floor an oxygen tank dr thayer's massive figure was in the shadow close to the bed and aleck van camp leaned over the curved footboard james lay on his pillow a ghost of a man still as death itself as agatha grew accustomed to the light she saw that his eyes were closed the lips under the ragged beard were drawn and slightly parted his forehead was the pallid forehead of death in life neither the doctor nor aleck moved or turned their gaze from the bed as agatha and mrs stoddard entered the air was still and the profound silence without was as a mighty reservoir for the silence within agatha stood by the footboard beside aleck while mrs stoddard getting a warm freestone from the invisible mr hunt in the hall placed it beneath the bedclothes aleck van camp dropped his head covering his face with his hands agatha watching by and by saw a change come over the sick man's face she held her breath it seemed for untold minutes while dr thayer reached his hand to the patient's heart and leaned over to observe more closely his face see she whispered to aleck touching his shoulder lightly he is looking at us when aleck looked up james was indeed looking at them with large serious half-focused eyes it was as if he were coming back from another world where the laws of vision were different and he was only partially adjusted to the present conditions he moved his hands feebly under the bedclothes where they had been warmed by the freestone and then tried to moisten his lips agatha took a glass of water from the table looked about for a napkin but seeing none wet the tips of her fingers and placed them gently over james's lips his eyes followed her at first but closed for an instant as she came near when they opened again they looked more natural as he felt the comfort of the water on his lips his features relaxed and a look of recognition illumined his face his eyes moved from agatha to aleck who was now bending over him and back to agatha the look was a salute happy and peaceful then his eyes closed again for an hour agatha and aleck kept their watch almost fearing to breathe Dr. Thayer worked, gave quiet orders, tested the heartbeats, let no movement or symptom go unnoticed. For a time, James kept even the doctor in doubt whether he was slipping into the great unknown 
or into a deep and convalescent sleep by the end of the hour however jimsy had decided for natural sleep urged thereto perhaps by that unseen playwright who had decreed another time for the curtain or perhaps he was kept by dr thayer's professional persuasions in defiance of the prompter's signal however the case the heart slowly but surely began to take up its job like an honest force pump the face began to lose its death-like pallor the breathing became more nearly normal dr thayer with mrs stoddard quiet and efficient at his elbow worked and tested and worked again and finally sat moveless for some minutes watch in hand counting the pulsations of james's heart at the end of the time he laid the hand carefully back under the clothes put his watch in his pocket and finally got up and looked around the room mrs stoddard was pouring something into a measuring glass agatha was standing by the window looking out into the blue night and aleck could be seen through the half-open door pacing up and down the hall dr thayer turned to his sister give him his medicine on the half-hour and then you go to bed that man hand will do now then he went to the door and addressed aleck well mr van camp unless something unexpected turns up i think your cousin will live to jump overboard again offhand as the words were there was unmistakable satisfaction happiness even triumph in his voice and he returned aleck's hand-clasp with a vice-like grip his masculinity ignored agatha or pretended to but she had followed him to the door as the old man clasped hands with aleck he heard behind him a deep oh doctor the next instant agatha's arms were around his neck and the back of his bald head was pressed against something that could only have been a cheek surprising as this was the doctor did not stampede but by the time he had got clear of aleck and had reached up his hand to find the cheek it was gone and the arms too susan stoddard somehow got mixed up in the general te deum in the hall and for the first time now that the fight was over allowed her feminine feelings that is a few tears to come to the surface aleck however went to pieces gone down in that species of mental collapse by which deliberate judicial men become reckless and strong men become weak he stepped softly back into the bedroom and leaned again over the curved footboard his face quite miserable he went nearer and held his ear down close to the bedclothes to hear for himself the regular beating of the heart slowly he convinced himself that the doctor's words might possibly be true at least he turned to hand who had come in and was adjusting the shades and asked him do you believe he's asleep in the tone of one who demands an oath oh yes sir he's sleeping nicely mr van camp i saw the change the moment i came in aleck still hesitated to leave fearful apparently lest he might take the blessed sleep away with him as he stood by the bed a low but distinct whistle sounded outside then after a moment's interval was repeated aleck lifted his head at the first signal took another look at james and one at hand then light as a cat he darted from the room and down the stairs leaving the house through one of the tall windows in the parlor mr chamberlain was standing near the lilac bushes his big figure outlined dimly in the darkness shut up aleck whispered fiercely as he ran toward him he's just got to sleep chamberlain gone to sleep like a baby don't make an infernal racket oh i didn't know didn't mean to make a racket began chamberlain when aleck plumped into him and shook him by the shoulders he's asleep like a baby he reiterated and chamberlain wise comrade took aleck by the arm and tramped him off over the hill to settle his nerves they walked for an hour arm in arm over the road that lay like a gray ribbon before them in the night winding up slantwise along the rugged country dawn was awake on the hills a mile away and by and by aleck found tongue to tell the story of the night which was good for him he talked fast and unevenly 
and even extravagantly chamberlain listened and loved his friend in a sympathy that spoke for itself though his words were commonplace enough by the time they had circled the five-mile road and were near the house again aleck was something like himself though still unusually excited chamberlain mentioned casually that miss reynier had been anxious about him and that all his friends at the big hotel had worried finally he chamberlain had set out for the old red house thinking he could possibly be of service in any case glad to be near his friend and by the way chamberlain added you may be interested to hear that i got on the track of that beggar who ate the hermit's eggs took a tramp this morning and found him held up at a kind of sailor's inn waiting for money grouchy old party no wonder his men shipped him aleck at first took but feeble interest in chamberlain's discoveries he was still far from being his precise judicial self he let chamberlain talk on scarcely noticing what he said until suddenly the identity of the man whom chamberlain was describing came home to him agatha's story flashed back in his memory he stopped short in his tracks halting his companion with a stretched out forefinger look here chamberlain he said i've been half loony and didn't take in what you said if that's the owner or proprietor of the jeanne d'arc a man known as monsieur chatelard french accent blonde above medium size prominent white teeth we want him right away he kidnapped miss redmond in new york and i shouldn't wonder if he kidnapped old jim and stole the yacht besides he's a bad one mr chamberlain had the air of humoring a lunatic well what's to be done is it a case for the law is there any evidence to be had law evidence cried aleck i should think so you go to big simon chamberlain and find out who's sheriff and we'll get a warrant and run him down heavens a man like that would sell his mother chamberlain looked frankly sceptical and would not budge until aleck had related every circumstance that he knew about agatha's involuntary flight from new york he was all for going to the red house and interviewing agatha herself but aleck refused to let him do that she's worn out and gone to bed you can't see her but it's straight you take my word we must catch that scoundrel and bring him here for identification to be sure there's no mistake and if it is he it'll be hot enough for him chamberlain doubted whether it was the same man and put up objections seriatim to each proposition of alex but finally accepted them all he made a point however of going on his quest alone you go back to the red house and go to bed and i'll round up eggs i think i know how the trick can be done aleck was stubborn about accompanying chamberlain but the englishman plainly wouldn't have it he told aleck he could do it better alone and led him by the arm back to the old red house where the kitchen door stood hospitably open sally was at work in her pantry the kettle was singing on the stove and the milk had already come from a neighbor's dairy sally's temper may not have been ideal but at least she was not of those who are grouchy before breakfast she served aleck and chamberlain in the kitchen with homely skill giving them both a wholesome and pleasant morning after their night of gloom you can't do anything right all day if you start behind hand she replied when aleck remarked upon her early rising besides i was up last night more than once watching for miss redmond the young man sleeping nicely she says she went cheerfully about her kitchen work giving the men her best womanlike and asking nothing in return not even attention they took her service gratefully however and there was enough of eve and sally to know it by the way chamberlain said aleck we must get a telegram off to the family in lynn he wrote out the address and shoved it across sally's red kitchen tablecloth and tell them not to think of coming adjured aleck we don't want any more of a soiree here than we've got now chamberlain undertook to send the message and since he had contracted to catch the criminal of the jean d'arc he was eager to be off on his hunt good-bye old man 
you go to bed and get a good sleep i'll stop at the hotel and leave word for miss rainier and you stay here so i'll know where you are i may want to find you quick if i land that bloomin beggar thanks said aleck weakly i'll turn in for an hour or so if sally can find me a bed mr chamberlain made several notes on an envelope which he pulled from his pocket gravely thanked sally for her breakfast and lifted his hat to her when he departed aleck dropped into a chair and was stupidly staring at the stove when sally returned from a journey to the pump in the yard you'll like to take a little rest mr van camp she said and i know just the place where you'll not hear a sound from anywhere if you don't mind there not being a carpet i'll go up right away and show you the room before i knead out my bread so she conducted aleck to a big clean attic under the rafters remote and quiet he was exhausted not from lack of sleep he had often borne many hours of wakefulness and hard work without turning a hair but from the jarring of a live nerve throughout the night of anxiety the past and the relationships of youth and kindred were sacred to him and his pain had overshadowed for the hour at least even the newer claims of his love for melanie rainier End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eighteen the spirit of the ancient wood agatha's first thought on awakening late in the forenoon was the memory of sally kingsbury coaxing her to bed and tucking her in in the purple light of the early morning she remembered the attention with pleasure and gratitude as another blessing added to the greater one of james hamilton's turn toward recovery sally's act was mute testimony that agatha was in truth heir to hercules thayer's estate spiritual and material she summoned lizzie and while she was dressing laid out directions for the day during her short stay in ilion lizzie had been diligent enough in gathering items of information but nevertheless she had remained oblivious of any impending crisis during the night her pompadour was marcelled as accurately as if she were expecting a morning call from mr straker no rustlings of the wings of the angel of death had disturbed her sleep in fact lizzie would have winked knowingly if his visit had been announced to her her sophistication had banished such superstitions she noticed however that agatha's candles had burned to their sockets and inquired if miss redmond had been wakeful mr hambleton was very ill everybody in the house was up till near morning replied agatha rather tartly oh what a pity could i have done anything i never heard a sound cried lizzie effusively no there was nothing you could have done said agatha it's very bad for your voice miss redmond staying up all night went on lizzie solicitously you're quite pale this morning and with your western tour ahead of you agatha let these adjurations go and answered it occurred to lizzie that possibly she had allied herself with a mistress who was foolish enough to ruin her public career by private follies such as worrying about sick people heaven in lizzie's eyes was the glare of publicity and since she was unable to shine in it herself she loved to be attached to somebody who could her fidelity was based on agatha's celebrity as a singer she would have preferred serving an actress who was all the rage but considered a popular singer who paid liberally as the next best thing there was always enough common sense in lizzie's remarks to make some impression even on a person capable of the folly of mourning at a deathbed agatha's spirits freshened by hope and the sleep of health rose to a buoyancy which was well able to deal with practical questions she quickly formed a plan for the day though she was wise enough to withhold the scheme from the maid agatha drank her coffee ate sparingly of sally's toast and leaving lizzie with a piece of sewing to do went first to james hambleton's room 
after ten minutes or so she slowly descended the stairs and went out the front way she circled the garden and came round to the open kitchen door sally was kneeling before her oven inspecting bread agatha watched her while she tapped the bottom of the tin held her face down close to the loaf and finally took the whole baking out of the oven and tipped the tins on the table that's the most delicious smell that ever was said agatha sally jumped up and pulled her apron straight lord miss redmond how you scared me couldn't you sleep any longer i didn't want to i'm as good as new tell me sally where all the people are mr hod is in mr hamilton's room i know but where are the others i guess they're all parcelled round said sally with symptoms of sniffing i don't want to complain miss redmond but we ain't had any such a house full since parson thayer's last conference met here and not so many then only three ministers and two wives though of course ministers make more work but i wouldn't say a word miss redmond about the work if it wasn't for that young woman that puts on such airs coming and getting your tray i ain't used to that sally paused like any good orator while her main thesis gained impressiveness from silence it was only too evident that her feelings were hurt agatha considered the matter but before replying came farther into the kitchen and touched the tip of a finger to one of sally's loaves lifting it to show its golden brown crust you're an expert at bread sally i can see that she said heartily i shouldn't have got over my accident half so well if it hadn't been for your good food and your care and i want you to know that i appreciate it she was reluctant to discuss the maid but her cordial liking for sally counseled frankness don't mind about lizzie i thought you had too much to do and that she might just as well help you but if she bothers you we won't have it and now tell me where mrs stoddard and the others are sally's symptoms indicated that she was about to be propitiated but she had yet a desire to make her position clear to miss redmond it's all right only i've taken care of the china for seventeen years and it don't seem right to let her handle it and she told me herself that anybody that had any respect for their hands wouldn't do kitchen work and if her hands are too good for kitchen work i'm sure i don't want her messing round here she left the tea on the stove till it boiled miss redmond just yesterday agatha smiled i'm sure lizzie doesn't know anything about cooking sally and she shall not bother you any more sally turned a rather less melancholy face toward agatha it's been fairly lonesome since the parson died i'm glad you've come to the red house the words came from sally's bliss gruffly and ungraciously but agatha knew that they were sincere she knew better however than to appear to notice them in a moment sally went on miss stoddard she's asleep in the front spare room said for me to call her at twelve poor woman she must be tired said agatha aunt susan's a stout woman miss redmond she didn't go to bed until she had prayers beside the young man's bed with mr hahn present i had to wait with the coffee and i guess mr hahn ain't very much used to our ways for when aunt susan had made a prayer mr hahn said yes ma'am instead of amen there was a mixture of disapprobation and grim humour which did not escape agatha she was again beguiled into a smile though sally remained grave as a tombstone mr hand will learn said agatha and was about to add like the rest of us but thought better of it sally took up her tale mr van camp and his friend came in just after i'd put you to bed miss redmond and ate a bit of breakfast right off her that table and twas a mercy i'd cleared all the colch out of the attic as i did last week for mr van camp he wanted a place to sleep and he's up there now used to be a whole lot of the parson's books up there but i put them on a shelf in the spare room the other man went off toward the village agatha looking about the pleasant kitchen was tempted to linger sally's conversation yielded to the discerning something of the rich essence of the past and agatha began to yearn for a better knowledge of the recluse who had been her friend unknown 
through all the years but she remembered her industrious plans for the day and postponed her talk with sally i remember there used to be a grove a stretch of wood somewhere beyond the church sally which way is it along the path that goes through the churchyard no this way right back ere the yard parson thayer he used to walk that way quite often sally went with agatha to another stile beyond the churchyard and pointed over the pasture to a fringe of dark trees along the farther border right there by that apple tree the path is but don't go far miss redmond the woods ain't healthy all right sally thank you i'll not stay long she called danny and started out through the pasture with the hound sober and dignified and happy at her heels the wood was cool and dim with an uneven wagon road winding in and out between stumps enormous sugar maples reared their forms here and there occasionally a lithe birch lifted a tossing head and farther within pines shot their straight trunks arrow-like up to the canopy above farther along the road widened into a little clearing beyond which the birch and maple trees gave place entirely to pines and hemlocks the underbrush disappeared and a brown carpet of needles and cones spread far under the shade the leafy rustle of the deciduous trees ceased and a majestic stillness deeper than thought pervaded the place at the clearing just within this deeper wood agatha paused sat down on a stone and took danny's head in her lap the dog looked up into her face with the wistful melancholy gaze of his kind inarticulate yet eloquent the sun was nearly at zenith and bright flecks of light lay here and there over the brown earth as agatha grew accustomed to the shade it seemed pleasant and not at all uncheerful the gaiety of sunlight subdued only to a softer tone the resolution which had brought her thither returned she stood up under the dome of pines and began softly to sing trying her voice first in single tones then a scale or two a trill at first her voice was not clear but as she continued it emerged from its sheath of huskiness clear and flute-like and liquid as the notes of the thrushes that inhabited the wood the pleasure of the exercise grew and presently warbling her songs there in the otherwise silent forest agatha became conscious of a strange accompaniment pausing a moment she perceived that the grove was vocal with tone long after her voice had ceased it was not exactly an echo but a slowly receding resonance faint duplications and multiplications of her voice gently floating into the thickness of the forest charmed like a child who discovers some curious phenomenon of nature agatha tried her voice again and again listening between whiles to the ghostly tones reverberating among the pines she sang the slow majestic lasia chio pianga which has tested every singer's voice since handel wrote it and then curious she tried the effect of the aerial sounding board with quick brilliant runs up and down the full range of the voice but the effect was more beautiful with something melodious and somewhat slow and there came to her mind an old-fashioned song which as a girl she had often sung with her mother oh that we two were maying down the stream of the soft spring breeze she sang this stanza through softly walking up and down among the pines danny at first walked up and down beside her gravely and then lay down in the middle of the path keeping an eye on agatha's movements her voice pitched at its softest now seemed to be infinitely enlarged without being made louder it carried far in among the trees clear and soft as a wave ripple entranced agatha began the second part of the song just for the joy of singing oh that we two sat dreaming on the sward of some sheep trimmed down when suddenly from the distance another voice took up the strain danny was instantly up and off to investigate but presently came back wagging and begging his mistress to follow him in spite of her surprise in hearing another voice complete the duet agatha went on with the song half singing half humming it was a woman's voice that joined hers singing the part quite according to the book with our limbs at rest on the quiet earth's 
breast and our souls at home with god the pine canopy spread the voices first one and then the other until the wood was like a vast cathedral filled with the softest music of the organ pipes there was nobody in sight at first but as agatha followed the path she presently saw a white arm and skirt projecting from behind the trunk of a tree danny wagging slowly appeared to wish to make friends and before agatha had time to wonder the stranger emerged and came toward her with outstretched hand ah forgive me i hid and then startled you but i was tempted by the song and this forest temple isn't it wonderful agatha looked at the stranger suddenly wondering if she were not some familiar but half-forgotten acquaintance of years agone she was a beautiful dark woman probably two or three years older than herself mature and self-poised as only a woman of the cosmopolitan world can be it might be that compared to her agatha was a bit crude and unfinished with the years of her full blossoming yet to come she had no words at the moment and the older woman still holding agatha's hand explained i did not mean to steal in upon you but as i came into the grove i heard you singing handel and i couldn't resist listening your voice it is wonderful especially here as she looked into agatha's face her sincere eyes and voice gave the praise that no one can resist the tribute of one artist to another this is indeed a beautiful hall i found it out just now by accident when i came up here to practice and see if i had any voice left said agatha she paused as it suddenly occurred to her that the visitor might be james hamilton's sister and that she was being delinquent as a hostess but come back to the house she said this is not a hospitable place exactly to receive a guest the stranger laughed gently <laughs> have you guessed who i am then no well you see i had the advantage of you from the first you are miss redmond and i followed you here from the house where your servant gave me the directions i am miss rainier melanie rainier and i am staying at the hillside mr van camp and to her own great surprise melanie blushed crimson at this point that is we my aunt and i were mr van camp's guests on board the seagull when he heard of the wreck of the jeanne d'arc we put in to charlesport though he has probably explained all this to you it was such a relief and pleasure to mr van camp to find his cousin ill as he was for he had feared the worst agatha had not heard miss rainier's name before but she knew vaguely that mr van camp had been with the yachting party when he arrived at charlesport now that she was face to face with miss rainier a keen liking and interest a quick confidence rose in her heart for her then perhaps you know mr hambleton said agatha impulsively the fever turned last night were you told that he is better no i don't know him said melanie shaking her head nevertheless i am heartily glad to hear that he is better much better they said at the house they were standing at the place where agatha had first discovered her visitor but now they turned back into the clearing come and try the organ pipes again she begged they walked about the wood singing first one strain and then another testing the curiously beautiful properties of the pine dome they were quickly on a footing of friendliness it was evident that each was capable of laying aside formality when she wished to do so and each was at heart frank and sincere melanie's talent for song was not small yet she recognized in agatha a superior gift while to agatha melanie rainier seemed increasingly mature polished full of charm they left the wood and wandered back through the pasture and over the stile each learning many things in regard to the other they spoke of the place and its beauty and agatha told melanie of the childhood memories which for the first time she had revived in their living background how our thoughts change she said at last as a child i never felt this farm to be lonely it was the most populous and entertaining place in all the world i much preferred the wood to anything in the city i love it now too but it seems the essence of solitude to me that is because you have been where the passions and restlessness of men have centred one is never the same after that 
strangely enough the place now belongs to me went on agatha parson thayer the former owner and resident was my mother's guardian and friend and left the place to me for her sake ah that is well cried melanie it will be your castle of retreat your sans souci for all your life i envy you it is charming pastor parson do you say parson thayer was a man of judgment yes and a man of strange and dominating personality in his way everything about the house speaks of him and his tastes even danny here follows me i really believe because i am beginning to appreciate his former master agatha stooped and patted the dog's head youth and health helped by the sympathy of a friend were working wonders in agatha she beamed with happiness come into the house she begged melanie and look at some of his books with me but first we'll find sally and get luncheon and perhaps mr van camp will appear by that time poor man he was quite worn out then you shall see parson thayer's books and flowers if you will they strolled over the velvet lawn toward the front of the house where the door and the long windows stood open down by the road and close to the lilac bushes that flanked the gateway stood a large silver-white automobile evidently miss rainier's conveyance the driver of the machine had disappeared i mustn't trespass on your kindness for luncheon to-day thank you melanie was saying but i'll come again soon if i may meantime she was moving slowly down the walk but agatha would not have it so she clung to this woman friend with an unwanted eagerness begging her to stay we are quite alone and we have been so miserable about mr hamilton's illness she pleaded quite illogically do stay and cheer us up and so melanie was persuaded easily too except for her compunctions about abusing the hospitality of a household whose first care must necessarily be for the sick i want to stay she said frankly the house breathes the very air of restfulness itself and i haven't seen the garden at all she walked back over the lawn looked admiringly out toward the garden with its purple and yellow flowers then gazed into the lofty thicket above her head where the high elm spread its century-old branches agatha standing a little apart and looking at melanie was again struck by some haunting familiarity about her face and figure she wondered where she could have seen miss rainier before aleck van camp appearing round the corner of the house made elaborate bows to the two ladies good morning miss redmond he said he greeted her cordially plainly glad to see her i slept the sleep of the blessed up there in your fragrant loft good morning miss rainier he walked over and formally took melanie's hand for an instant i knew it was decreed that you two should be friends he went on in his deliberate way in fact i've been waiting for the moment when i could have the pleasure of introducing you myself and here you have managed to dispense with my services altogether but let me escort you into the house sally says her raised biscuits are all ready for luncheon agatha looking at her new friend's vivid face saw that mr van camp was not an unwelcome addition to their number she had a quick superstitious feeling of happiness at the thought that the old red house gathering elements of joy about its roof was her possession and her home i've promised to show miss rainier some queer old books after luncheon she said aleck wrinkled his brow i'll try not to be jealous of them End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Nineteen. Mister Chamberlain Sleuth. Unbeknown to himself, Mister Chamberlain possessed the soul of a conspirator. Leaving Alec Van Camp at the crisp edge of the day, he fell into deep thought as he walked toward the village as he reviewed the information he had received he came more and more to adopt agatha's cause as his own and his spirit was fanned into the glow incident to the chase he walked briskly over the country road descended the steep hill 
turning over the facts as he knew them in his mind by the time he reached charlesport he regarded his honor as a gentleman involved in the capture of the frenchman his knowledge of the methods of legal prosecutions even in his own country was extremely hazy he had never been in a situation in his hitherto peaceful career in which it had been necessary to appeal to the law either on his own behalf or on that of his friends legal processes in america were even less known to him but he was not daunted on that account he remembered sherlock holmes and raffles he recalled bill sykes and de Bosk, dodging the operations of justice and in that romantic chamber that lurks somewhere in every man's make-up he felt that classic tradition had armed him with all the preparation necessary for heroic achievement he chamberlain was unexpectedly called upon to act as an agent of justice against chicanery and violence and it was not in him to shirk the task his labors which for the greater part of his life had been expended in tracing the evolution of blind fish in inland caves had not especially fitted him for dealing with the details of such a case as agatha's but they had left him eminently well equipped for discerning right principles and embracing them chamberlain's first move was to visit big simon who directed him to the house of the justice of the peace israel cady squire cady in his shirt-sleeves and wearing an old faded silk hat was in his side yard endeavouring to coax the fruit down gently from a flourishing pear tree you wait just a minute if you please until i get these two plump pears down and i'll be right there he called courteously without looking away from his long-handled wire scoop mr chamberlain strolled into the yard and after watching squire cady's exertions for a minute or two offered to wield the pole himself takes a pretty steady hand to get those big ones off without bruising them cautioned the squire but chamberlain's hand was steadiness itself and his eyesight much keener than the old man's the result was highly satisfactory no less than a dozen ripe pears were twitched off just in the nick of time so far as the eater was concerned well thank you sir thank you said squire cady that just goes to show what the younger generation can do now then let's see got any pockets he picked out six of the best pairs and piled them in chamberlain's hands then took off his rusty old-fashioned hat and filled it with the rest of the fruit chamberlain carefully stowed his treasures into the wide pockets of his tweed suit now sir squire cady said heartily we'll go into my office and attend to business i'm not equal to cincinnatus whom they found ploughing his field but i can take care of my garden come in sir come in chamberlain followed the tall spare old figure into the house the squire disappeared with his pears leaving his visitor in the narrow hall but he returned in a moment and led the way into his office it was a large rag-carpeted room filled with all those worsted knick-knacks which women make and littered comfortably with books and papers squire cady put on a flowered dressing-gown drew a pair of spectacles out of a pocket a bandana handkerchief from another and requested chamberlain to sit down and make himself at home the two men sat facing each other near a tall secretary whose pigeonholes were stuffed with papers in all stages of the yellowing process squire cady's face was yellowing like his papers and it was wrinkled and careworn but his eyes were bright and humorous and his voice pleasant chamberlain thought he liked him come to get a marriage license the squire inquired chamberlain immediately decided that he didn't like him but he foolishly blushed no it's another sort of matter he said stiffly not a marriage license all right my boy agreed squire cady tisn't the fashion to marry young nowadays i know though twas the fashion in my day not a wedding what then then chamberlain set to work to tell his story placed as it were face to face with the law he realized that he was but poorly equipped for carrying on actual proceedings even though they might be against belial himself but he made a good front and persuaded squire cady that there was something to be done the squire was visibly affected at the mention of the old red house and fell into a reverie 
looking off toward the fields and tapping his spectacles on the desk hercules thayer and i read latin together when we were boys he said turning to chamberlain with a reminiscent smile on his old face and he licked me for liking hannibal better than scipio he laughed heartily the faces of the old sometimes become like pictured parchments and seem to be lighted from within by a faint steady gleam almost more beautiful than the fire of youth as chamberlain looked he decided once more and finally that he liked squire katy but i got even with hercules on horace the squire went on chuckling at his memories however he sighed as he turned toward his desk again this isn't getting out that warrant for you we don't want any malefactors loose about charlesport but you'll have to be sure you know what you're doing do you know the man can you identify him i think i should know him but in any case miss redmond at the old red house can identify him we don't want to arrest anybody till we're sure we know what we're about that's poor law said squire katy in a pedagogical and squireish tone as if chamberlain were a mere boy but the englishman didn't mind that i think i can satisfy you that uh, we've got the right man he answered if i find him and bring him to the old red house this afternoon so that miss redmond can identify him will you have a sheriff ready to serve the warrant yes i can do that very well then and thank you sir said chamberlain moving toward the door and i'm keen on hearing how you got even with mr thayer on the horse the light behind the squire's parchment face gleamed a moment come back my boy when you've done your duty by the law every citizen should be a protector as well as a keeper of the law so come again the latch-string is always out it was mid-morning before the details connected with the sheriff were completed by this time chamberlain's heavy but sound temperament had lifted itself to its task gaining momentum as the hours went by his next step was to search out the frenchman the meagre information obtained the day before was to the effect that the marooned yacht owner had taken refuge in one of the shacks near the granite docks in the upper part of the village he had persuaded the caretaker of the sailor's reading room to lend him money with which to telegraph to new york as the telegraph operator had refused to trust him it was not difficult to get on his trade even though the village people were constitutionally reluctant to let any unnecessary information get away from them a mile or so farther up the shore beyond the road that ran like a scar across the hill to the granite quarry chamberlain came upon a saloon masquerading as a grocery store a lodging house a seaman's bethel and the reading room were grouped near by the telegraph office too had been placed at this end of the town obviously for the convenience of the operators of the granite quarry the settlement had the appearance of easy-going and pleasant industry peculiar to places where handwork is still the rule chamberlain applied first at the grocery store without getting satisfaction the foreign-looking boy who was the only person visible could give him no information about anything but at the reading-room the erstwhile yacht owner was known borrowing money is a sure method of impressing one's personality the frenchman had been in the neighbourhood two or three days latterly becoming very impatient for a reply to his new york telegram a good deal of money had been applied for was the opinion of the money lender this person caretaker and librarian was a tall ineffective individual with eyes set wide apart his slow speech was a mixture of dr johnson and a judge in chancery it was grandiloquent and it often took long to reach the point he informed chamberlain with some circumlocution that the frenchman had been extremely anxious over the telegram i tried to persuade him that it was useless to be impatient over such things said he and i regret to say that the man allowed himself to become profane i dare say but it would appear that he has received his telegram by this time continued the youth for it is now but a short time since he was summoned to the station 
chamberlain thinking that the sooner he got to the telegraph station the better was about to depart when the placid tones of the librarian again casually broke the silence if i mistake not the gentleman in question is even now hastening toward the village he waved a vague hand toward the open door through which a little distance away a man's figure could be seen why don't you run after him and get your money asked chamberlain but he didn't know the youth what good would that do was the surprising question which chamberlain could not answer but the englishman acted on a different principle he thanked the judge in chancery and made after the frenchman who was casting a furtive eye in this and that direction as if in doubt which way he ought to go nevertheless he seemed bent on going and not too slowly either the englishman swung into the road but did not endeavour to overtake the other they were travelling toward the main village along a road that more or less hugged the shore sometimes it topped a cliff that dropped precipitately into the water and again it descended to a sandy level that was occasionally reached by the higher tides near the main village the road ascended a rather steep bluff and at the top made a sudden turn toward the town as chamberlain approached this point he yielded more and more to the beauty of the scene the bay of charlesport the rugged curving outline of the coast beyond the green islands the glistening sea the blue crystalline sky over all it was a sight to remember not far from the land at the near end of the harbour was the seagull pulling at her mooring a stone's throw beyond chamberlain's feet a small rocky tongue of land was prolonged by a stone breakwater which sheltered the curved beach of the village from the rougher waves close up under the bluff on which he was standing the waters of the bay churned and foamed against a steep rock wall that shot downward to unknown depths it was obviously a dangerous place though the road was unguarded by fence or railing only a delicate fringe of goldenrod and low juniper bushes veiled the treacherous cliff edge it was almost impossible for a traveller unused to the region to pass across the dizzy stretch of highway without a shuddering glance at the murderous waves below on the crest of this cliff each of the two men paused one following the other at a little distance the first man however paused merely for a few minutes rest after the steep climb chamberlain hardened to physical exertions took the hill easily but stood for a moment lost in speculative wonder at the scene he kept a sharp eye on his leader however and presently the two men took up their indian file again toward the village some distance farther on the road forked one spur leading up over the steep rugged hill another dropping abruptly to the main village street and the wharves a third branch ran low athwart the hill and led finally to the summer hotel where chamberlain and the reniers had been staying at this division of the road chamberlain saw the other man ahead of him sitting on a stone he approached him leisurely and assumed an air of business sagacity good day sir said chamberlain planting himself solidly before the man on the stone he was rather large blond pale and unkempt in appearance but nevertheless he carried an air of insolent mockery it seemed to chamberlain he glanced disgustedly at the englishman but did not reply rather warm day remarked chamberlain pleasantly no answer the man sat with his head propped on his hands unmistakably in a bad temper want to buy some land inquired chamberlain i'm selling off lots on this hill for summer cottages waterfront dock privileges and a guarantee that no one shall build where it will shut off your view terms reasonable like to buy none snarled the other chamberlain paused in his imaginative flight and took two luscious yellow pears from his bulging pockets have a pear he pleasantly offered the man again looked up as if tempted but again ejaculated none chamberlain leisurely took a satisfying bite i get tired myself he went on tramping over these country roads 
but it's the best way for me to do business you don't happen to want a good hotel do you coarse fare and the discomforts of beggars lodgings had told on the frenchman's temper as chamberlain had surmised he looked up with a show of human interest chamberlain went on there's a fine hotel the hillside over yonder over a mile or so away best place in all the region hereabouts tip-topping set there too count somebody or other from germany and no end of bigwigs so of course they have a good cook chamberlain paused and finished his second pair the man on the stone was furtive and uneasy but masked his disquiet with the insolent sneering manner that had often served him well chamberlain having once adopted the role of a garrulous travelling salesman followed it up with zest of course a man can get a good meal for that matter at the red house a little way up yonder over the hill but it wouldn't suit a man like you a slow pokey place with no style the man on the stone slowly turned toward chamberlain and at last found voice for more than monosyllabic utterances i was looking for a hotel he said in correct english but with a foreign accent and i shall be glad to take your advice the hillside you say is in this direction and he pointed along the lower road yes heartily assented chamberlain about two miles through those woods and you won't make any mistake going there it's a very good place the man got up from the stone and the other inn you spoke of where is that the red house that's quite a long piece up over the hill this way straight road house stands near a church kept by a countrywoman named sally but the hillside's a place for you good style everything neat and handsome and fine people very well thanks cut in the other in his sharp rasping tones i shall go to the other side he slid one hand into a pocket as if to assure himself that he had not been robbed by sleight of hand during the interview and then started on the road leading to the hillside chamberlain said good day sir without expecting or getting an answer and turned down the hill toward the village as soon as he had dropped from sight however he walked casually into the thick bushes that lined the road and from this ambush he took a careful survey of the hill behind him then he slowly and cautiously made his way back through the underbrush until he was again in sight of the cross roads here concealed behind a tree he waited patiently some five or ten minutes at the end of that time chamberlain's mild and kindly face lighted up with unholy joy he opened his mouth and emitted a soundless ha ha for there was his recent companion also returning to the crossroads taking a discreet look in the direction of the village as he came along seeing that the coast was clear he turned and went rapidly up the road that led over the hill to the old red house when chamberlain saw that the man was well on his way he stepped into the road and solemnly danced three steps of a hornpipe and the next instant started on a run toward the village he got little simon's horse and buggy drove into the upper street and picked up the sheriff and then trotted at a good rattling pace around by the long road toward ilion End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twenty. Monsieur Chatelard takes the wheel. Sally Kingsbury would have given up the ghost without more ado had she known what secular and unministerial passions were converging about Parson Thayer's peaceful library. As it was. She had a distinct feeling that life wasn't as simple as it had been heretofore, and that there were puzzling problems to solve. She was almost certain that she had caught Mr. Hond using an oath, though when she charged him with it, he had said that he had been talking Spanish to himself. He always did when he was alone. Sally didn't exactly know the answer to that, but told him that she hoped he would remember that she was a professor. What's that? inquired hand 
it's a christian in good and regular standing and it's what you ought to be said sally and now that nice mr chamberlain whom she had fed in the early morning had dashed up to the kitchen door behind little simon's best horse deposited a man from charlesport and then had disappeared the man had also unceremoniously left her kitchen he might be a minister brought there to officiate at the church on the following sabbath sally surmised but on second thought she dismissed the idea he didn't look like any minister she had ever seen and was very far indeed from the parson thayer type hercules thayer's business including his ministerial duties had formed the basis and staple of sally's affectionate interest for seventeen years and it wasn't her nature to give up that interest now that the chief actor had stepped from the stage so she speculated and wondered while she did more than her share of the work she picked radishes from the garden for supper threw white screening over the imposing loaves of bread still cooling on the side table and was sharpening a knife on a whetstone preparatory to carving thin slices from a veal loaf that stood near by when she was accosted by someone appearing suddenly in the doorway is this the red house it was a cool sharp voice sounding even more outlandish than mr hans sally turned deliberately toward the door and surveyed the newcomer well yes i guess so but you don't need to scare the daylights out of me that way the stranger entered the kitchen and pulled out a chair from the table give me something to eat and drink the best you have and be quick about it too sally paused carving knife in hand looking at him with frank curiosity well i snum you ain't the new minister either now are you the stranger made no answer he had thrown himself into the chair as if tired suddenly he sat up and looked around alertly then at sally who was returning his gaze with interest where are you from anyway she inquired we don't see people like you around these parts very often i dare say he snarled are you going to give me a meal or must i tramp over these confounded hills all day before i can eat oh i'll get you up a bite if that's all you want i never turned anybody away hungry from this door yet and we've had many a worse-looking tramp than you i guess miss redmond won't mind miss redmond the stranger started to his feet glowering on sally look here is this place a hotel or isn't it well anybody think it was the way i've been driven from pillar to post for the last ten days but you can't stay i'll get you a meal and a good one too sally's good nature was rewarded by a convulsion of anger on the part of the guest fool idiot he screamed you tricked me in here you lied to me oh set down set down interrupted sally you don't need to get so head up as all that i'll get you something to eat there ain't any hotel within five miles of here and a poor one at that thus protesting and attempting to soothe sally saw the stranger make a grab for his hat and start for the door only to find it suddenly shut and locked in his face mr chamberlain moreover was on the inside facing the foreigner if you will step through the house and go out the other way mr chamberlain remarked coolly it will oblige me my horse is loose in the yard and i'm afraid you'll scare him off he's shy with strangers the two men measured glances i thought you travelled afoot when pursuing your real estate business sneered the stranger i do when it suits my purposes replied chamberlain what game are you up to anyway in this disgusting country inquired the other ridding it of rascals this way please and chamberlain pointed before him toward the door leading into the hall as the stranger turned his glance fell on sally still carving her veal loaf idiot he said disgustedly well i haven't been caught yet anyhow said sally grimly chamberlain's voice interrupted her this way and the first door on the right make haste if you please monsieur chatelard at the name the stranger turned standing at bay but chamberlain was at his heels you see i know your name it was supplied me at the reading room here on the right quickly the hall was dim almost dark 
the only light coming from the open doorway on the right whether he wished or no monsieur chatelard was forced to advance into the range of the doorway and once there he found himself pushed unceremoniously into the room it was a large cool room lined with bookcases near the middle stood an oblong table covered with green felt and supporting an old brass lamp four people were in the room besides the two newcomers aleck van camp was on a low step ladder just in the act of handing down a book from the top shelf near the step ladder two women were standing with their backs toward the door both were in white both were tall and both had abundant dark hair one of the french windows leading out on to the porch was open and just within the sill stood the man from charlesport here's a wonderful book a rare one the record of that famous latin controversy aleck was saying when he became conscious of the entrance of chamberlain and a stranger ah hello chamberlain that you he cried agatha and melanie turning suddenly to greet chamberlain simultaneously encountered the gimlet gaze of chatelard it was fixed first on melanie then on agatha then returned to melanie with an added increment of rage and bafflement but he was first to find tongue so he sneered i find you after all princess auguste stephanie of crovetz consorting with these these swine melanie looked at him keenly with hesitating suspicions ah duke stephen's cat's paw i remember you well but before the words were fairly out of her mouth agatha's voice had cut in mr van camp that is he that is he the man on the jeanne d'arc we thought as much answered chamberlain that's why he is here we only wanted your confirmation of his identity said the man who had been standing by the window as he came forward monsieur chatelard you are to come with me i am the sheriff of charlesport county and have a warrant for your arrest as the sheriff advanced toward chatelard the cornered man turned on him with a sound that was half hiss half an oath he was like a panther standing at bay aleck turned toward melanie it seems that you know this man melanie yes i know him to my sorrow what do you know of him he is the paid spy of the duke stephen my cousin he does all his dirty work melanie laughed a bit nervously as she added turning to chatelard but you are the last man i expected to see here i suppose you are come from my excellent cousin to find me eh is that the case chatelard's eyes resting on her burned with hate yes your highness i am the humble bearer of a message from duke stephen to yourself and that message is a command for your immediate return to crovetz matters of importance await you there and if i refuse to return chatelard's shoulders went up and his hands spread out in that insolent gesture affected by certain europeans chamberlain stepped forward impatiently look here you people he began you told me this chap was a blooming kidnapper and so i rounded him up i nabbed him and here you are exchanging how de do what's the meaning of it all as he spoke chamberlain's eyes rested first on melanie then on agatha whom he had not seen before by jove he ejaculated whom did he kidnap questioned melanie why me miss rainier cried agatha he stole my car and drugged me and got me into his yacht heaven knows why kidnapped you cried melanie just so agreed aleck and now i see why you scoundrel he turned upon chatelard with contemptuous fury for once you were caught eh these ladies are much alike that is true so much so that i myself was taken aback the first time i saw miss redmond you thought miss redmond was the princess masquerading as an opera singer her highness has always been admired as a singer cut in chatelard no doubt and even you were deceived aleck laughed in derision but when you take so serious a step as an abduction my dear man be sure you get hold of the right victim 
she was even singing the very song that used to be a favourite of her highness remarked chatelard your memory serves you too well but chatelard turned scoffingly toward agatha you sang it well mademoiselle very well and as this gentleman asserts you deceived even me but you are indiscreet to walk unattended in the park agatha unnerved and weak had grown pale with fear don't talk with him mr van camp he is dangerous get him away she pleaded true miss redmond we only waste time sheriff again the sheriff advanced toward chatelard and again he was warned off with a hissing oath at the same time a shadow fell within the other doorway as chatelard's glance rested on the figure standing there his face gleamed he pointed an accusing forefinger there is the abductor if any such person is present at all said he that is the man who stole the lady's car and ran it into the dark he is your man mr sheriff not i the accusation came with such a tone of conviction on the part of the speaker that for an instant it confused the mind of every one present in the pause that followed chatelard turned with an insolent shrug toward agatha this lady and every word had a sneer in it this lady will testify that i am right agatha stared with a face of alarm toward the doorway where han stood silent if that is true miss redmond began the sheriff no no cried agatha he had nothing to do with it questioned the sheriff as he waited for her answer agatha suddenly came to herself her trembling ceased she looked about upon them all with her truthful eyes looked upon han standing unconcernedly in the doorway upon chatelard in the corner gleaming like an oily devil no he had nothing to do with it she said chatelard's laugh beat back her words like a bludgeon <laughs> liars oh liars he cried i might have known but chamberlain was impatient of all this and now monsieur kidnapper you can walk off with this gentleman here and you can't go one minute too soon the penitentiary is the place for you chatelard turned on him with another laugh you need not feel obliged to hold on to me mr land agent i know when i'm beaten which you englishmen never do got another of those pears you offered me this morning before chamberlain could make reply or before the sheriff and his prisoner could get to the door there was the chug of an automobile a second later urgent and loud voices penetrated the room first from the steps then from the hall one was the hearty voice of a man the other was lizzie's can't see her tell me i can't see her after i've run a hundred miles a day into the jungle on purpose to see her the idea where is she in here and in stalked mr straker with cap linen duster and high gaiter boots he was pulling off his goggles well what's this a family party where's miss redmond mr straker cried agatha that's me oh there you are why don't you open up and get some light i can't see a thing wait a minute mr straker agatha was saying when suddenly the attention of everybody in the room was drawn outside when chamberlain had told chatelard that his horse was loose in the yard it happened to be the truth now excited by fear of the strange machine that had just arrived the horse with flying bridle rein was snorting and prancing on his way to the vegetable garden it was almost beyond masculine power to resist the impulse of pursuit alec and chamberlain sprang through the window the sheriff went as far as the lawn after them and in that instant chatelard slipped like an eel through the open door and out to the gate to straker's machine still chugging the sheriff saw him as he jumped in hey there he shouted and made a lively run for the gate but before he reached it chatelard had jerked open the lever loosened the brake and was passing the church at half speed hey there quick called the sheriff he's got away but mr hand had already thought what was best to be done come on here's another machine we'll chase him he cried as he went for the white motor-car standing farther back under the trees it had to be cranked which required some seconds but presently they were off hunt and the sheriff in hot pursuit after straker's car 
chamberlain and alec triumphantly leading the horse came back in time to see the settling cloud of dust mr chamberlain mr van camp cried agatha they've gone they've got away who's got away demanded chamberlain all of them groaned agatha as she sank down on the piazza steps jiminy christmas ejaculated mr straker this beats any ten twenty thirty i ever saw regular dick deadwood game and he's run off with my new racer what yelled chamberlain did that bloomin sheriff let that bloomin rascal get away he isn't anybody i'd care to keep chuckled straker but you know that new racer's worth something did shuttler go off in that machine again inquired chamberlain slowly and distinctly of the two women precisely said melanie while agatha's bowed head nodded by jove that sheriff's a duffer here van give me the horse and with the words chamberlain grabbed little simon's best roadster mounted him bareback and turned his head up the road i'll catch him yet he yelled back but he didn't three miles farther along he came upon the wreck the racer was lying on its side in a ditch which recent rains had converted into a substantial volume of mire and mud the white machine was drawn cosily up under a spreading hemlock farther on but mr hand and the sheriff were nowhere in sight as chamberlain stopped to gaze on the overturned car he heard the crashing of underbrush in the woods nearby the steps came nearer it was evident the chase was up they were off the scent and obliged to return hm, grunted chamberlain and for once the clear springs of his disposition were made turbid with satire we're all a pack of bloomin osses that's what we are what in hell's the matter with us while he was tying the horse to a tree hound appeared silent with an unfathomable disgust written on his countenance as usual he who was the least to blame came in for the hottest of the censure and yet there was a sort of fellowship indicated by chamberlain's extraordinary arraignment of them both he was scarcely known ever to have been profane but at this moment he searched for wicked words and interspersed his speech with them recklessly if not with skill it is the duty of the historian to expurgate i don't know just how you happen to be in this game pronounced chamberlain hotly but all i've got to say is you're an ass an infernal ass hand rolling up his sleeves remained silent i suppose if you'd had a perfectly good million dollar banknote you'd have let it blow away piff right out of your hands he fumed or the title deed to mount olympus or a ticket to a front seat in the new jerusalem that's all it amounts to catch an eel only to let him slip through your fingers eh hey, you mr han made no answer instead he waded into the ditch stream and placed a shoulder under the racing car chamberlain's instinct for doing his share of work caused him to roll up his trousers and wade in shoulder to shoulder with hand even while he was lecturing on the feebleness of man's wits good horse running loose into barbed wire fences had to be caught but it didn't need a squadron of men and a forty-acre lot to do it in might have known he'd give us the slip if he could biggest rascal in europe and so on chamberlain usually rather a silent man blew himself empty for once conscious all the time that he himself was quite as much to blame as hand could possibly have been and hand knew that he knew but kept his counsel hand ought to be prime minister by this time when the racing car was righted he went swiftly and skilfully to work investigating the damage and putting the machine in order as far as possible chamberlain presently became impressed with his mechanical dexterity by jove you can see into her can't you hand continued silent and left it to his companion to put on the finishing verbal touches tow her home and fill her up and she'll be all right eh said chamberlain but hand kept on tinkering the sudden neighing and plunging of little simon's poor tormented horse gave warning of the sheriff crashing from the underbrush directly into the road 
he was voluble with excuses the fugitive had escaped leaving no traces of his flight he might be in the woods or he might have run to the railroad track and caught the freight that had just slowly passed he might be in the next township or he might be oh go to thunder said chamberlain End of chapter twenty